I'm Jan Visser, and I have the pleasure of meeting with Martin Witt in Belleville, which is an area of Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, we've known each other for quite a couple of years. I think the first time we met was in 2010. You wrote a chapter for a book that I'm the principal editor of on seeking understanding the lifelong pursuit to build a scientific mind. And your chapter is about a shifting mind of economics. That's correct, yeah. I understand you're an economist and you have special interests in the environment and natural resources. That's correct, That's yes. That's correct. Yeah. And so my first question actually is, um, what led you to that interest in economics? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Jan. Um, I've thought about that myself quite a lot in the last few years because I'm taking a more philosophical position on economics nowadays. I think initially I was interested in economics um, because it has the power to explain the real world. That's what I wanted out of economics because there's so much um, happening in this world that does have an economic meaning, if you like it or not. Um, we all have budgets, we have household budgets, we run them, we have limits, we have so many money we have, we can only spend so much. And how do these forces work? What is the power of these forces? And I studied economics and I got some answers, but certainly not all answers. Mm -hmm. And the other special interest in the, the come later, the uh, natural resources, the environment, or was that right from the start that it was also part of your concerns? It was right from the start, a part of my concern. Mm -hmm. um, I've grown up in a place in, in South Africa where there's a lot of nature and we always went on nature holidays, so there's an inborn love for nature that, that I have, or at least created in my young adulthood and, my, and when I was a child. And um, we went out a lot in nature areas, so there's this disconnect between what's happening in, in the economic world and the natural world, mm -hmm. and I tried to reconcile them. So hence the interest in natural resources and environmental economics right, right from the beginning, actually. <laughs> You, you mentioned your childhood, but when I converse with scientists and ask them that sort of question, uh, where does it come from? They often refer to something way back in their experience, sometimes when they were only four or five years old, things that happened. Are there any links there in your case, you said that they're, 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 they're those very um, powerful experiences that you had as a child that have moved you into in, in this direction? Yeah, I think it's more a gradual movement. It wasn't one powerful moment or something. It's a gradual movement of being, um, having a large plot of land to work on with, with, with our family. We had our own vegetable gardens. Um, when we went on holiday, it was usually to nature locations, nature conservancies or national parks or places with exceptional beauty. So if it's, it's in our family. We tend to go to those places rather than shopping at the mall. Um, so it was, it was a, bit in, a bit in the DNA of the family as well. And then the business side, uh, my grandfather was a businessman. Um, he ran his own business. He was, he was a, an economist. On the other side of the family, um, my other grandfather was also a business economist. So I think it, it, runs, it runs from both sides, yeah. 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 Now looking at your publication record and also at the chapter that you wrote on the shifting mind of economics, um, you reveal a great interest in transdisciplinarity. Uh, from where comes that interest in your case? I think it's, it's the same interest that drove me to economics in a sense that you want to understand reality. And economics give, at the end, partial answers to that, at least in the theoretical setup of economics. Mm -hmm. So it's the same desire, it's the same making sense of the world. And transdisciplinarity is, I think, another step towards getting closer to that. We, uh, we, we assume that the different disciplines have something to say and together um, you put it on a new footing, you have a discussion about that, you theorize about that, and, and, and sometimes you get new insights. So I think it's very good to have transdisciplinary discussions on the basis of very good disciplinary insights. So you need to be an economist or an engineer, or you have to train in a specific area in depth to have a discussion that goes broader. 
So I think that, that's where my interest in transdisciplinarity came from. It, it mutated out of, it evolved out of, out of economics yeah. in a sense. Has it, it changed you intellectually also? I mean, you're, you're an economist, you're trained as an economist, you're not trained as a psychologist or whatever, or uh, an, an artist, or the, the, no. but you're, you're right about aesthetics, about ethics. Um, so I don't think anyone who works in a transdisciplinary field uh, would not be necessarily an expert in all those different aspects of no. the research. But has it influenced you in the in intellectual terms to take that transdisciplinary position? Yes, and obviously you start running into your own limitations. So you yeah. have to either work in bigger groups and work with others, um, or and or a strategy of <coughs> studying something else as well. So I did a master in arts. In, in the last three years as a sort of a, a mid-career into Meso and which was very good because it just it just portrays to you and it it, 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 it brings down to you exactly what how much how arts people are thinking about work about, about life it's very different than, than economists and scientists in yeah. a sense I'm not saying economists are scientists but sometimes they think they are well, uh, <laughs> depends on the definition of science depends on the definition of scientists actually yeah. if, so if we're talking about uh, seeking understanding uh, it would definitely uh, fall into that uh, absolutely envelope. yeah so it's it's a very logical way of pro progressing in knowledge with with economics um, mimicking the the classical physical way of seeing the world and and, and arts is way different it's what about different. ethics Ethics, yeah, felt that obviously falls into, in, into, the, into the boundaries, within the boundaries of arts, mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, although there's also a lot of ethics implied in economics, which are never made explicit. So, and, and having an arts education gives you some um, um, tools to challenge economists, myself, um, by making the ethical positions explicit, which is in, inside economics. It's assumed, but it's never discussed. Mm -hmm. um, like maximizing utility, which is just a given in economics, it's, it's an axiom. So we start from that. But it's a very utilitarian philosophy underlying yeah. that that needs exposition. Where does it come from? What is its limitations? Um, why are people thinking like this? How has it developed historically? Um, usually economics as a discipline doesn't answer those questions because they don't deem them to be really important. But if you have an arts education, suddenly you become sensitive to those those questions. And I think they, they set you back in a sense because you're not uh, scientifically doing the work that an economist should be doing if you follow an economic career path. But I always believed you follow your interests. It, uh, science is not normally seen as having anything to do with values. In fact, many scientists would say you should, that, should leave that out. In your chapter, you challenge that idea. Yeah. Um, can you explain? Yeah, I think it comes a long way, the split of science and um, facts and values. David Hume in, in has got a huge impact, had a huge impact on economic thinking on Adam Smith, for instance, and he was adamant about the fact that you need to, to keep yeah. them very separate. Um, only things that are known empirically are, are counting as facts. And values are just airy fairy stuff that it's okay for you, but it doesn't count as evidence. Kant obviously said that as well. Um, he didn't say that that explicit as Hume did. Hume is more empiricist, and Kant was still open to the fact that meta metaphysical properties can be speculated about. Um, there's values that are there. But he said that doesn't count as a reality in the sense. It's not something we can build a worldview on. So it, it needs to needs to be phenomena that, that we study. And the nomadical world, Kant's nomadical world, um, is something that is it's private. It's up to you. It's so uh, the values we have is, is up to you. I have a certain value, you have a certain value, and that's fine. It doesn't count as as evidence for making a scientific claim. That's, that's where we come from, and I think most of our society is still organized like that. The philosophy of science nowadays is challenging that and saying that it, it's, it's, not, it's not true a reflection on reality even. They say, uh, through experimental work for instance, in economics even, that people, moral um, 
considerations and values matter in decision making. It's empirically measured. Mm -hmm. um, one good example is, is, is people's inclination towards fairness. Um, if there's if there's if there's a hundred dollars and there's a hundred dollars on the table, we both now we know that there's a hundred dollars, and basically it's my hundred dollars, but somehow we need to split that. I give you one dollar, still you bet off because I'll take the other ninety nine. You will refuse, you refuse the one dollar because <laughs> this is not fair. Mm -hmm. You at least give me half of that, and it's not rational in that sense because you could have the one dollar, but most people, I think. Every experiment they did, people just flatly refused. So there's, 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 there's a measure of fairness in empirical work coming through. And where does that come from? Mm -hmm. That's a value yeah. that, that, that's in our, in our human society. It's, it's, it's whether you do this in the United States of America or South Africa or Burma or China, you get the same results. But yeah. well, that's, of course, at a very elementary level very of elementary, individual yeah. behavior in a particular experimental context. Sure. But the value issue is also becoming more important because we see changes in the world that sort of compel us to start thinking about, do we really want that? Yes. Um, so, with your chapter, you, you're not only arguing why, uh, how that such a change in the, in the, in the, um, in the economic mind has occurred among economists, uh, but you, I think you also have a purpose with that chapter to bring about change within uh, the community of your colleagues and perhaps beyond. Uh, could you say a little bit about that as well? Yeah, I think, I think change is happening. So mm -hmm. I'm writing about the change that is happening. Um, there's a shifting mind occurring. There's a whole institute of new economic thinking, for instance, that's taking a lot, uh, on board a lot of these behavioral as well as um, uh, issues around complexity and dynamics um, in complexity science that's bringing that into the economic sphere. Um, there's change happening uh, already for a number of decades around how we treat the environment and economics, although mm -hmm. it's been internalized in economic thinking. So it's the same philosophical basis, but it's, it's broadened out to include environmental issues. So change is happening. It's being translated into monetary terms. To, to monetary terms, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a change. The environment is seen now as something that's scarce and that needs to be commodified and traded. Obviously, that evokes a lot of philosophical resistance uh, because there's intrinsic value in the environment, people would argue. Yeah. Uh, but the change is happening in the, in the economic sector and the economic thinking. The question is if that change um, is effective, whether that, that change is also policy and practice. And I couldn't find too much um, evidence for that yet. Um, obviously, you need to do quite big empirical work on how people think in departments and how that economic work is going through towards policy and what things are changing on the, on the macroeconomic uh, modeling level, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but in the big institutions, it's the same game in town as being the orthodox economic game, and that hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's even intensified in a sense. And in the world at large, particularly in the we call the Western world, uh, the power of neoliberalism, it has not been really affected by that change. No, it's, it's, it's a philosophical thinking, it's a change in, in thought, it's, it's, it's mainly academic and think tanks. And the theory of change that analyze what they do is suggesting that it's a slow process, it's gradual, it's, it's focused on learning and thinking things through. It's not so much focused um, on policy change yet or practice yet. How do, how do we get the policy makers and decision makers to transform their mindset as well? Yeah, I think that, that, that is a process of, of change. And, and uh, there's, there's two ways of viewing change is the gradual, change one and then the abrupt one and I don't think we in for an abrupt one even after a big financial crisis we had in 2007-8 and the ecological crisis that's ongoing and ongoing we do not see abrupt changes in the economic force um, translated into policy and practice what we do see is a lot of changes in how people think about the reality and if you look at philosophy and philosophical ideas how they, how they translate into thinking and then they translate into policy and practice, it can easily take 100 years. Mm -hmm. 
So the first existentialist, when was it? In, in, in the late 19th century somewhere. And, and, and nowadays existentialism is, is, is a given in a lot of, not even in, in economic thought, but it's, there's a lot of given in, in, in how people think about the reality. So I think the same, same happens in the philosophy of economics. It, it, takes, it takes a number of years before it becomes part of textbooks, yeah. textbooks and teaching and, and how that mutates into, into modeling and then it goes into policy and practice. Mm -hmm. Well, we got to know each other also in the context of the various uh, Building the Scientific Mind Colloquia that we yeah, organized. You participated in two of them, I think. Yeah. One in Stellenbosch in 2011 and in Lembang, no, yes, Lembang in, in Lembang 2013. Yeah. What, what, uh, what has been the impact of those colloquia on your thinking? I think they they sort of challenged me to put my thoughts into into something palatable for other, others to listen to, um, and then later to write it up. Um, for instance, the reflections that I did in 2008 in at Stellenbosch at, at the uh, building the scientific mind was on sustainability. So I, I, I wrote a reflection on the ecological economic crisis, and that was the first draft, which was discussed with colleagues. And it was, I brought it out to a conference in Crete two, three years later in a revised version, but that brought it one step further. And there it was presented to a bunch of uh, Orthodox Greek theologians, <laughs> which was quite interesting. Um, and it also enriched the debate for me, coming from, I never met anybody in that, in that sort of perspective. So they gave their perspective. There was a whole conference around ecological crisis. And then I wrote it up and then it was published in that book. So I think, I think it was a stepping stone. And, and likewise for, for Lembang, it was on beauty, beauty and harmony. It's usually a topic us economists do not think too much about. Um, it's something that's too esoteric or it's too much value la laden that economists don't have a category for that. So I really need to think that through. And what I presented in Lembang was my initial thoughts on that. I've never written it up in a publication yet, but I have referred to in, in this chapter to that particular section and pulled it out a little bit more. What does aesthetics mean for economics? Where does it come from? And interestingly enough, Paul Krugman, who's a leading economist nowadays, is referring to the fact that economists have mistakenly viewed their elegant models, beautiful models, as something yielding completely a delusionary outcome. Mm -hmm. it's, it's got no link to reality. So there is a link with beauty and the beauty lies in the mathematical elegance of the economist model and I've never seen it that way. It's, it's quite an interesting re revelation yeah. if, you, if you don't see that perspective from outside your own discipline you never think about that. Mm -hmm. But that is indeed what us economists try to do. It struck me when you wrote that in your chapter actually because the, um, as a physicist I, for, for me that experience is different and also from um, Metro Collis in the word in, in Lembang, and he explains that quite differently. Um, when as an economist you talk about the beauty of, of models, models are man-made, whereas uh, from a physicist's point of view, you're looking at the beauty of nature. Yeah. And yeah. you see that often expressed in, in mathematical expressions of uh, how nature works. And it's, um, so we as physicists would never be critical of uh, the use of that idea. In fact, there have been some very famous physicists like Bourdieu, who just said it should be, it must be viewed beautiful. And, uh, otherwise, it's uh, whereas this is different. It's not you're not talking about your capacity to create beauty, but it's about the beauty that is being given to you. Yeah. So it's an interesting difference. No, there is an interesting, very interesting difference, and I mentioned uh, Chandra Sekar, which refused yeah, we saw that. <laughs> to, to, to truth and, and beauty, and, and he mentions obviously that there's some transcendental good uh, out Absolutely. there that, that's beautiful, and we, we start discovering yeah. that. And, and economists, if there's, if there's something, uh, if there's some analogy to that, it would be the fact that the human mind is so beautiful that it can dream up those models. Mm -hmm. And that comes from a long philosophical tradition of, of cognition as, as, as a way to the truth and the good yeah. and the beautiful. So in a way, we, we economists have taken that on board. And interesting enough, as you, know, you mentioned the, 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 the physicist's sense of beauty, that, that's not something economists have, have a category for. 
Um, yes, we have a category for that, but it's in the mind. Mm -hmm. It's analytical, um, often. And it's coming back, it's coming back. There's, there is, uh, like, like Amartya Sen, um, uh, Nussbaum, um, the ecological economists, they're referring to beauty in a very different way. They, 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 they refer to that as a metaphysical, transcendental concept. Yeah. And they say we can derive some no, There's a great wealth. beauty, of course, in ecology. And ecology, you see those things around yeah. you. What does that mean? Where does it come from? So I think there's, there's engagement, but it's certainly not part of the mainstream. It's not mm -hmm. part, of, part of the core of economics. Yeah. About your chapter, what kind of impact do you want it to have? Uh, I'm modest about that, Jan, to be, to be quite honest. Um, I know I'm an economist. Your desire is just not modest. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a modest contribution. The, the, this, this discussion is ongoing. I try to document a, a, few, a few notes of that. And I think, I think what it brings it into this book is, is the focus on learning. Um, we economists need to keep on learning and we need to re-educate ourselves to keep on learning. It's not a revealed truth that we have seen 30, 40 years ago and just building on that truth. It needs, it, it's a historical thing, it's, it's ongoing. Economics mm -hmm. is an ongoing reflection on reality. And in that sense, economics is very powerful and a great subject to, to be taught in and to teach and to apply. Um, but in that sense only, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not trying to be dogmatized. The, dogma, the, the, the dogma around economics is, 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 not, is not the end of it. Um, there's certainly good truth values in certain aspects of economics. There's empirical measurements around people's behavior, but it's crude. It's rather crude. And behavioral economics is now changing that. They're starting to take on board that humans are quite complex and mm -hmm. have various kind of outcomes and various kind of drivers which is good and it's coming into the discipline already. Um, I've mentioned complexity science as, as another thing. It's, it's happening. Evolutionary economics is picking that up and say, well, the world is complex, it's dynamic. Let's try to model that. So it's already coming into, into the science. Um, yeah, those are two, two examples. Yeah, a chapter like the one you wrote is by, by its very nature, is it will be perceived as difficult by a number, at least a number of readers. I checked it out with a couple of people. And, uh, th th that would be something that they would say about it. And basically, I think that it's because of the complexity of the, uh, of the subject that, that you're dealing with. Uh, it can't be captured within the bounds of one single discipline. So we, when it really has to broaden one's mind in doing that. Do you have any advice to the readers to help them uh, really digest such a chapter? Open mind, that's, that's the first one. I think um, that's something I experience myself when I pick up a difficult text. Yeah. Um, are, am I willing to engage with this or am I not willing to engage? I'm not willing to engage as I want to defend my position. And open mind means you read the text and you put it down, you think a bit about it and you don't understand everything. But you come back later and you read it again, something like that. More, it's more a process of learning um, or you discuss it with somebody else. So I've read this thing, can you read it? Let's have a quick discussion about that. that. That reveals much more than trying to wade through something that you don't understand yourself. When I pick up a, a text in, in physics, I mean, I've done physics 25 years ago in high school. It's, it's, it's a wonderful subject. I love it, but I can't keep up with what's happening in physics. Yeah. So sometimes I read something and say, do I understand this properly and I need to talk to a physicist? Not even I can keep Yeah, up you can't the keep up with these things. There's biology, it's, it's very interesting. What's yeah. happening in biology uh, is lying some cultural uh, foundations for thinking now in economics. Mm -hmm. Biological economics is coming through as something that's interesting. And obviously, you can't keep up with everything. Yeah. Um, but because those a, basics in the mindset actually that that, are, uh, that you that you derive from having been involved in a discipline that remain even if you can't keep up with the detail. Absolutely, yeah. You continue to think as an economist. You continue to think as a physicist, and and, and in doing that, I think when you when you move into this uh, to this to the more transdisciplinary issues, you indeed start broadening your minds. And you do that in groups. You do that with other people, yeah. and I think group learning is is vital. Yeah, the dialogue is important. Dialogue is important, and and just for not only for for reinforcing your own ideas, but yeah. to break them open. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and ob and obviously re uh, a dialogue with people outside your discipline. Mm -hmm. And I had dialogues with theologians now for three years, which was revealing and very interesting. So they mm -hmm. they break some preconceptions open, and you need to start to go back to your disciplines and test that, um, and test that not the one science above the other, but no, exactly. You have to test them in, interactively, mm -hmm. so it's it's a process of, of openness and learning between economics and physics, uh, the physics and biology, and theology and philosophy, and you have that together, and it's it's a melting pot, and it, it unsettles people. It really unsettles people. They just want to get their, 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 their dissertations done, or they just want to get their PhDs done, or they just want to get the project done. Um, but in a sense, you will not get a lot of people coming with you. But I think in a transdisciplinary way, you get a small, small band of people that's always willing to challenge um, what our thoughts about the world is. And in a sense, that uh, I want, don't want to send, to, not too arrogant, but in a sense, that moves civilization forward. It's, it's people that keep on being critical yeah. and be realistic about things. So I've used the term critical realism. As a, as a way of doing things and maybe that's a way forward is group group building being critically realistic with each other and then move forward thanks John thank you so much Martin you're more than welcome great thank you sure.